Greetings and God's blessings to you this third Sunday after the Epiphany. If I sound a little different to you today, it's because I'm without a headset this weekend, or as the French say, sans headset. Tell you the story why it would take longer than the sermon, so I say let's get right to it. So this is, as I said, the third Sunday after the Epiphany, the Old Testament lesson from Nehemiah chapter 8, reading verses 1 to 3, 5 to 6, and then 8 to 10. The epistle lesson from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, reading verses 12 to 31, and the Holy Gospel for today, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. The sermon text is based on the Gospel lesson. This is Luke chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 20 to 24 in Jesus' name. And Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Lord Jesus, these are your words, and therefore they are the truth. We ask you to sanctify us by this truth. Amen. We all know why Sauk City, Wisconsin is famous. The first Culver's opened there in 1984. Sauk Center, a town in Minnesota, also has a claim to fame. It was the hometown of Sinclair Lewis. Sinclair Lewis is famous because in 1930, he was the first American to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Before he was famous, he was the doctor's kid, an intelligent young man, but kind of a loner. When he was 17, he went east to college and, as some children do, never looked back on the place where he grew up. In 1920, he wrote a novel that became a bestseller. The novel was called Main Street. Main Street took place in a fictional Midwestern town called Gopher Prairie, which, critics said, was based on his hometown. As you might expect, the folks back home were eager to read what their native son had written. They opened a page one and read that Gopher Prairie was a small, ugly town full of small-minded, ugly people. The people from Sauk Center were so hurt that many libraries in the area removed the book from their shelves. But the people who suffered most from Main Street's fame were students at the high school. Throughout the 1920s, whenever they would play a game on the road, their opponents would taunt them by calling them Main Streeters. Eventually, based on the philosophy of, if you can't beat them, join them, the school decided to adopt the name. Even today, Sauk Center High School remains the home of the Main Streeters. In our gospel text, we hear how the people in Jesus' hometown were angry with him. Did they have a good reason? Had he done them wrong? Let's explore these questions together and discover the truth. The Lord takes care of his own. The service Jesus attended at his hometown synagogue would not have looked or sounded so unusual to us. Jesus stood up to read a text from Scripture, in this case Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. When he was finished, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down to preach on that text. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And this was the theme of his sermon that day. He began to say to them, Today this Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What did they think of Jesus' sermon? All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Those reactions don't sound so unusual either. They seem reasonable. What doesn't seem reasonable is Jesus' reaction. Why does he get so confrontational? Why does he say that they don't accept him? They don't seem hostile. But before you know it, they're trying to throw him off a cliff. How did things go downhill so quickly? The Spirit of the Lord, show us the answer. 
it starts with the text that Jesus chose for his sermon. When he took every me from Isaiah and pronounced them fulfilled in himself, Jesus was telling the people he grew up with that he was the Messiah, God's anointed one, sent to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, or the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was instituted by God in the Old Testament to be a great homecoming for Israel. Every 50th year, slaves were to be set free and debtors' prisons opened up, while properties that families had sold to make ends meet were given back to them. Jesus proclaimed that day in Nazareth to be day one of that blessed year, but the people weren't convinced. If those words were being fulfilled in their hearing, if every me in the text applied to Jesus, then words like poor, captives, blind, and oppressed applied to them. Some people might be offended by that. If you're talking to someone who's never been to church, and you tell them that our service begins with a confession of sin, they might be taken aback. They may wonder how candid or specific they're expected to be. They may think that sin is too strong to describe the mistakes they've made. After all, to call something sin is very out of date. The People in Nazareth were working through thoughts like these, and here's where the story gets confusing. I know it says in this translation, and this is ESV that we use in our bulletins, it says that they spoke well of him. But in the Greek, it simply says they testified about him. In other words, they talked about what they knew about Jesus. The Greek doesn't say whether those things were good or bad. When it says they marveled or wondered about him, that doesn't mean they believed in him. These people were not rejoicing. They were shaking their heads. The more they thought about Jesus' words and the more they looked at him, the unhappier they became. Who is Joseph's son to tell us who he is and tell us who we are? Did he come home just to belittle us and tell us how ugly and small-minded we are, like we're a bunch of main streeters? He performs miracles in the other towns. Take Capernaum, for instance. Jesus healed an official son. He gave a paralyzed man the strength to walk, and when he was in their synagogue, he drove out a demon. So let's have less talk and more action. If he's the Messiah, why does he think it's enough just to read the scriptures to us and talk about them for a while? We want something more. Scripture readings today show us how the preaching of law and gospel always produces different results. In the Old Testament lesson, it says, all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And then Ezra told them to celebrate, for this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the people did rejoice. It says in verse 12 of that chapter, Nehemiah 8, they rejoiced because they had understood the words that were declared to them. A very different response to the word among the Nazarenes came from a lack of understanding and a misinterpretation of why Jesus had come. If they had listened to his word, they would have understood, they would have learned the truth. Jesus had come not to expose their sins, but to atone for them, to cover them over with his precious blood, to give his life for them, and make himself a public spectacle by his death on the cross. He was willing to bear the sins and even the name of those who rejected him. When the mob said they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus didn't say, Nazareth? I got out of that town a long time ago. No, he said, I am he. When the sign above his cross said Jesus of Nazareth, he did not object. When Jesus comes to us in his word, it's not to publish our secret sins so that our neighbors can read all about them. And the point is not to condemn us, because by nature you and I are condemned already. Jesus comes to grant us forgiveness of sins by faith in him. Faith is his desired response when law and gospel are preached. And that begins with a change in heart worked by the Holy Spirit. Now, it isn't always as emotional as the people in the Old Testament lesson responded, but 
It shouldn't look like the response of the people in Nazareth either. And I don't just mean the cliff incident. I mean, quoting this proverb too, physician, heal yourself. If Anton Chekhov is famous in America, it's because of his plays. In his native Russia, he's known more as a writer of short stories. But to the people who personally knew him, he was known first as a devoted doctor. When his father abandoned them to escape his creditors, Anton supported his family, even as he put himself through medical school. He began to write articles and stories on the side for extra money. As a doctor, he traveled the whole length of Russia, through Siberia, all the way to islands in the Pacific Ocean. He was struck by and began recording how poorly the government treated prisoners. Perhaps we're not too sympathetic to the treatment of prisoners, but in those days in that country, wives and children followed condemned men into those remote places, and they too lived in miserable poverty. When Chekhov returned from his long trip, he chose to settle down in a village south of Moscow and continue his practice. He said, if I am a doctor, then I need sick people in a hospital. If I am a writer, then I need to live among people. Every day, early in the morning, the sick would be lined up outside his house, some of them lying on carts on which they had ridden all night. Many writers would have turned their back on this kind of society, but Chekhov spent himself on taking care of them, serving the poor free of charge, paying for their medication out of his own pocket, and having no regard for his own health. You see, the year he got his MD was the same year Anton Chekhov got tuberculosis. That long trip he made to help the prisoners and their families didn't help his disease, nor did those long hours in the village. The day came when he had to leave his village for warmer climates. There was no cure for him. In 1904, he died at the age of 44 in a spa town in Germany, a good and noble physician who could not heal himself. Let's think about what Jesus, our great physician, was willing to go through for us. He took up our infirmities and the burden of our sins as he stumbled under the weight of his cross. The whole time he had to listen to the taunts of his people. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ. Physician, heal yourself. But it wasn't himself he was interested in healing. It was us. Jesus was willing to suffer rejection and humiliation and pain while carrying all my sins in order that I should be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. Doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. It is not fair to give our doctor orders. It is not fair to act like the people of Nazareth and dictate to Jesus how best he can serve us, to say, I hear of miracles all around me, and everyone else seems to be living the good life, so why am I left out, Lord? Whatever you are suffering right now, has Jesus not suffered it? Has he not felt what you feel? And does he not feel it right now? He hears what's ailing you. He knows what you need, and he knows how to sustain you with his holy word and sacraments. The great physician always takes care of his own. When the mob arrested him, he told them to let his disciples go. When he was dying on the cross, he made sure his friend would take care of his mother. When he had risen from the dead and forgiven Peter's cowardly denials, he said, feed my lambs and my sheep. When we confess our sin and the risen Savior comes to us with his gospel, he does not throw his work of atonement in our face and say, I knew you'd come crawling back after you treated my words like garbage. Take this and get out. His gospel is gentle. He covers over our sins freely and heals us without cost. That we may have the same care for one another and trust him all the more. We will not be ashamed to be called Christians. and We will not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He has come to make his home with us and lead us to our heavenly home, always by the best way, 
path of righteousness for his name's sake. The Lord takes care of his own, now and forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.